morning, everyone, and welcome to Hillside Community Church and our Sunday morning broadcast for February the 21st, 2021. I'm glad that you've joined us today. We're continuing in our series in the book of 2 Peter. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21 is my text this morning. Um, before I start, I just wanted to make a quick announcement for members of our congregation. Um, we had scheduled to have our annual AGM the last Sunday of February, which would be next week, but we're postponing it because of our present uh, continuing lockdown until the end of March, the last Sunday in March 2021. I'll be forwarding further information to you as we go um, concerning that meeting. Anyways, um, I'm glad you're with us this morning, and, and let's get into the Word of God. But before we do, would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your faithfulness in the midst of everything that's happening around us. God, you care so much about our health and well-being spiritually. And, and, and Lord, I, I just pray for each person that's out there. Some may be discouraged, some may need encouragement from your word this morning. and Some need to focus on what's important. And Father, I just pray for each person's individual walk with you, that Father, that what you uh, have, a have desired to accomplish this morning would be done in Jesus' name. Amen. So, it's evident that with the Apostle Peter being unable to be with the people in the churches out there because he was in jail, um, there was an environment that was starting to um, be created in the church where some were coming to the local flocks or rising in the local flocks and were questioning the apostolic authority of Peter and, and his fellow apostles concerning the first person accounts they had given concerning the life and work of Jesus. And um, in addition to this, when you throw in the human nature of uh, the congregation and the individual perspectives on how things ought to be done, um, there was a creeping vine of uncertainty, I guess you might say, as to whether a new group of teachers which were starting to speak things in the church that were different than what the apostles had presented to them. And people were questioning and, and there was uncertainty as to whether these new upcoming teachers that were uh, speaking in the churches were more correct in their understanding of the faith than were the apostles. Now, Peter is concerned with the health and well-being of the believers. And this letter was written to the churches in Asia, Asia Minor, but it applies to the churches throughout the age, uh, to our present age, throughout the ages to our present age. As Peter was unable to be with the believers in person, and these circumstances were beyond his control, he earnestly desires to qualify his perspective with them concerning Jesus and the ministry and the gospel um, in writing. And he, and he wants, and he's writing this letter um, with a heart that's earnest to see people um, stay on track. And in the last verse of my sermon from last Sunday, Peter set the stage for what I'm going to speak on today. And uh, the last verse of last Sunday's sermon was this, verse 15 of chapter 1. And I will make every effort, says Peter, to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So, Peter knows that his time with the church is short. Soon he's going to be called home. He knows that he's going to be put to death. So he wants to impart to the believers the reality of all that he has witnessed and, and remind them of this. He wants to go on the record to silence some of the doubts that were likely creeping in through dissident teachers that, was, that were seeding other thoughts among them, straying from the pure truth of the gospel as presented by Peter. So you might compare the environment at hand, I, I think if you look in scriptural parallels, um, this is kind of like the environment surrounding Moses and Aaron in the Old Testament, um, recorded in Numbers chapter 18. You know, people were unsettled, and there was pressure from the difficulties of the wilderness environment around them. And uh, a number of the people in that, that Numbers 18 example had developed 
kind of, I guess you would say, a rebellious attitude towards their leadership and were questioning Moses and Aaron's ability to lead the people um, due to the circumstances they were facing. Now, God had appointed Moses and Aaron, but there was a great uh, number of people that were beginning to question whether they were fit to lead. Um, certainly, individuals that were in the camp thought that they might take advantage of the people's unsettledness due to the circumstances they're facing and rise up against their God-appointed leadership. Now, here the Apostle Peter is in jail and there were certain people taking advantage of that and other people who were in the churches that were like, well, Peter and the other apostles can't be with us right now, so maybe we ought to do something different. And um, things in the physical realm for the early churches were getting more and more difficult. Uh, persecution was rising up against them. And like that environment in Numbers 18 with the children of Israel in the wilderness, um, the children of God in the churches in Asia Minor were in that same state. Um, they, uh, they were uh, restless and they were wondering what was happening. And Paul faced this as well, the Apostle Paul. And now we see Peter here addressing and confronting the same dissident spirit that was starting to take root in the people. So, Peter starts out in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. He says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Peter affirms that he was writing truthfully to the churches before he leaves to ensure that they understood who they were in Christ and the promises that God had passed on to them through him, through his ministry. He wants to assure them that what he had taught them was not because he was trying to manipulate them to his own end. If Peter had wanted to, he could have done something much more lucrative with his life in the natural realm and spared himself from all the suffering that he was enduring. He, he was not following some cleverly devised stories when he told them about Jesus and the power of the Lord's ministry. He and the other apostles were eyewitnesses of Christ's majesty. Now, sometimes particularly when the going gets tough out there, we can find ourselves falling prey to doubts that come our way. We can ask ourselves the question, well, how do we know that what we have been taught to believe in is actually real? You can be sure that our enemy is quick to take advantage of this situation and, and he will influence people to come in with false teaching to, to massage these doubts, introducing new and different and better ways for us to travel than the ways that were taught by the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles. Now this is what Peter is addressing. He assures the people that despite the murmurings of doubt which were being raised, he had no ulterior motives to present Jesus in the way that he had outside of the fact that what he was telling them was the truth. Eleven of the twelve apostles, in the end, gave their lives for Jesus Christ. Um, they did not receive any special benefits for giving their lives to the cause outside of heaven, but in this world they, we, they were suffering, and they suffered. They were true under-shepherds of the flock of Christ, caring for the sheep and looking after the sheep, even if it meant uh, discomfort and, and danger to themselves. When the wolves came to pillage the flock, hired hands will flee, but the true shepherds stay with the flock. The apostles stayed and discharged the duties of their ministries, even as the Lord Jesus Christ, their chief shepherd, had done before them. Jesus said of himself in John chapter 10, 11 to 13, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd, and the sheep are not his own. 
When he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and then runs away. Then the wolf pounces on them and scatters the flock. The man runs away because he's a hired servant and is unconcerned for the sheep. Peter was fulfilling the role of under-shepherd. He was being a good shepherd as appointed by the chief shepherd, Jesus, in dispensing all of the duties of his ministry. Just as all under-shepherd leaders of the church are called to do, but sometimes they don't do it. Um, Peter reminds the church that he had personally experienced the glory of God uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he wanted to emphasize this. There he was on the Mount of Transfiguration when the Father God spoke out of the cloud to himself along with James and John. The Father endorsed Jesus' person, position, and ministry. Now it's good for us to revisit the picture of the glory of this scene as recorded in Matthew 17, verses 1-3, to which reads, After six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before him. And get this, this is spine tingling. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Wow, what, uh, what an experience. This is the unveiled glory of our true shepherd, Jesus, our chief shepherd. The book of Revelation, John, the revelator, also gives a description of Jesus in a similar way. His face shines like the sun. He's just brilliant. And this transfiguration was given at the time for the benefit of Peter, James, and John, but also for the church that would be built on the foundation of Christ and his apostles in the future. This was done for us. Peter wanted to impart this vision of Christ and imprint it on the minds of his readers. So at the end of this transfiguration revelation, uh, the Father God speaks to the three apostles from heaven. Matthew 17, 5-9 tells us, While he was still speaking, A bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Can you imagine if you were there? There wouldn't be one of us. That would be standing. If that happened to us, we'd be on our faces before Jesus, just like uh, Peter, James, and John were. But Jesus came up and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So here is Peter now in in his epistle, telling the believers in the church of Asia Minor and all who are reading the book, including us today, what God did in revealing himself to them. No, he wasn't just telling some elaborate fairy tale about Jesus. Peter saw Jesus face to face in this incident, and the three apostles saw his unveiled glory on that mountain. And they were commissioned by the Lord to spread his gospel message, and now Peter was obeying his calling as he finished his mission on the earth to tell the people about the transfiguration experience they had just because... Jesus had instructed them to do so after he had been raised from the dead. Peter was being obedient. He was laying the foundation of the essentials that the church needed to believe to be healthy and steadfast in the kingdom of God. You see, we have to have the correct view of Jesus if we're going to be healthy as believers. Sometimes we undersell him. We put him in a box. We make him smaller than he is. Yes, Jesus was approachable. Yes, Jesus was... God with skin on, but the power and the majesty uh, of the glory of Jesus Christ cannot be understated. And as a church, we cannot forget who he is. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the creator of the heavens and the earth. All things are under his authority. 
And this Jesus, who has all of this authority, says, do not be afraid. And he comes near to us. What a beautiful, what a beautiful picture of his majesty. Jesus, our shepherd, will not abandon his sheep to the wolves. The wolves might come to try and scatter the sheep, but Peter won't abandon the sheep. Neither will Peter abandon the flock to be scattered by the false teachers because he is a good under-shepherd, faithful to his calling. Peter is not a hireling, and he stands with Jesus, commissioned by Jesus to watch over and protect his flock. And this is the importance of the calling of God. God has called uh, different people to be shepherds, to be under-shepherds of the king. And he wants us to look at this example of Peter and continue to truthfully represent the Lord Jesus Christ um, in what has been shown to us through his word and also through personal experience. In sharing with the, the people his eyewitness account of the transfiguration, Peter was affirming to them that Jesus Christ was God's appointed Savior to the world. And I'm repeating this today, affirming the same fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is God, and nothing is beyond the spectrum of his control, so we don't have to be afraid. We can trust in him. We can, entrust, uh, we can trust in the teachings of Christ, in the teachings of the apostles, to keep us safe as we journey through this world. Jesus was not a myth, and he was not merely a good storyteller, as some false teachers of the day we're trying to say, and they're still saying it today. Jesus had come in the flesh and had revealed his glory to humanity. He will truly be with all of us who believe until the end of the age, and then he will come and welcome us richly into his kingdom in the end, and all of our struggles will be completed, and he'll make everything new. See, Peter wanted them to see this, and, and all the teachings that he gave to them, he wanted them to understand that he wasn't just doing this for some reason, for his own benefit. He was doing this because it's truth. And he was commissioned by God to preach the truth to the people. But Peter didn't end with his dialogue about the matter here. He, he wanted to go deeper with the believers in his thoughts. We see him continued on, a, on another thread. Reading from our text, in verses 19 to 21, Peter wrote, We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all else, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, through human spirit, uh, though humans spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter continues to emphasize the truth of the message that he and the other apostles had been imparting to the churches. Not only is it good for us to understand the fact that Christ had given the apostles first-hand encounters, which proves the integrity of their message, but the churches also needed to consider the weight, yes, the weight of the, the, the prophetic word which had been given to them as a foundation for the life, work, and ministry of Christ. Now, these prophecies accurately predicted Christ before his coming. The life, mission, and work of the Messiah was prophesied from ages before. The Old Testament writings are full of references to the future Savior, where he would come from, how he would show himself, and what he would accomplish when he came. There are over 332, at least 332 distinct Old Testament prophecies uh, concerning the Messiah uh, Christ, which have been perfectly fulfilled. The combination of this evidence together, um, from a simple statistical perspective, perspective is absolutely overwhelming. It's, I don't know how many zeros are on the end of it, but it's many, many, many zeros 
that this is supernatural. There is no natural way that Jesus could have fulfilled all the prophecies written about him. Peter tells the readers of his letters that they would do well to consider what was being shared with them as reliable. He compares the prophetic foundation speaking to the life of Jesus as a light that is shining in the darkness, showing a person where they should walk safely and avoid stumbling. That is to say, they can be sure of the truth of God's word. They can safely walk in the light of it until the day that, that, that the full day dawns, when the present church age ends and Jesus comes back for his saints. There will come a day when the morning star rises in our hearts and we meet Jesus face to face. No wonder Peter could say that the prophetic word is confirmed and that it is a light that shines in a dark place, something we should cling to until the day dawns and Jesus Christ returns. These prophecies of Scripture, however, were not clever inventions of man like so many self-proclaimed prophets of this day. The prophets of Scripture heard from the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. And what they said came true and it was confirmed through what they had spoken and the reality of how things unfolded. You see, they weren't carried along by the will of man, but the will of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter sets the stage here. In the next chapter of this book, he's going to confront false teachers who lead people to dangerous heresies because they claim to know God and they claim to speak on behalf of God, but really they're following their own imaginations and they fall into their own uh, interpretations, the private interpretations of the prophecies of Scripture, which are flesh-driven at best or demon-inspired at worst leading God's people astray as their interpretations have no impulse from God. Head knowledge of prophecy is not enough. The inter interpretation of prophecy needs the illumination of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Jews who resisted and ultimately put Jesus to death, they had different ideas and they tried to interpret the messianic prophecies in accordance with the ideas that they had in their head as to how things should go, rather than looking at it at face value in the way that God had intended. The Messiah, um, in the minds of the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the, the Messiah that they were looking for would come into the world as a warrior king, he was the king who would wield the physical sword with force and might and put an end to the wickedness of the Roman tyranny. And he would establish the kingdom of God and a physical kingdom on earth, much like his forefather, King David, did. Now, don't get me wrong. At the end of the age, after the tribulation, there will come a time where Jesus will physically come and he will have a sword and he will be on a white horse and he will conquer. But th this, this was not the timing of that. The kingdom of God was um, in a different way than what the religious leaders wanted to, uh, to see the Messiah as being involved in. And Jesus didn't meet their expectations as the warrior king. He didn't carry a sword. Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount because they wanted the Messiah to be of their own making, a Messiah who would provide them with relief in this temporary physical realm. They picked out the prophecies that they could interpret on how they wanted the Messiah to be, and they rejected Jesus Christ, their true Messiah, because he did not fit their bill of human expectations. Experts in the Old Testament, Scripture, rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Why? Because they approached the prophecies of Scripture with mere human wisdom. Jesus confronted these men in his ministry. We see him dialoguing with them in John chapter 8, 43 to 45. Why don't you understand what I am saying? It is because you are unable to accept my message. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and the father of all lies. 
but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. See, even though the true messianic prophecies of the Old Testament were numerous, and they stared them in the face, these men, who are experts in the law, did not see. For example, the prophet Zechariah made a prediction of the Messiah in Zechariah 9.9, saying, Rejoice greatly, O people of Zion! Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem! Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, even on a donkey's colt. But because they were stubborn in the way that they thought the kingdom of God was going to be established, they were blinding, um, they were blinded, I guess, by their pride. And they didn't see Jesus fulfilling the prophecy as recorded in John chapter 12, 12 to 15. The next day, the, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A huge crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, Praise God! Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hail to the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey's colt and sat on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Israel. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Furthermore, be, because they were blinded, when the people were singing praises and laying cloaks and palm branches down before Jesus as he entered Jerusalem, the Pharisees, who were these experts, were upset at the spectacle and said to Jesus in Luke 19:39 to 40 Teacher, rebuke your disciples, I tell you, he answered. If they remain silent, the very stones will cry out. See, these Pharisees had been groomed in the scriptures from a very young age. They should have known, but they missed what was right in front of them because they had human ideas on how the world should unfold and how the Messiah should act, but they were wrong. And in, in um, Peter's day, there was false teachers coming up, and they were presenting a different gospel. They, they were wanting to do things their way. But Peter was like, no, follow the example that we have laid down. Follow the example that Jesus laid down. Today, it's equally important that we don't try to put Jesus with sword in hand, riding on the white horse, before the time comes when he will. You see, Jesus came to us in humble circumstances, and his kingdom is established on the earth um, in, in a different manner than what some of us might like. Some of us want... We long for Christ to come on his white horse and his sword. But we have to be patient and have to pray for God's will to be done because that day will be a terrible day for those who are God's enemies. And right now, you see, Jesus Christ is delaying, the Father is delaying the coming of the Son because of his love for mankind. His patience for humanity is great and he desires that more would come to know him before he pours out his wrath, and his judgment on the earth. This is why it's so important for us as believers in this last day to properly and carefully approach the prophetic word of God in the context that it was designed. You see, context is everything. When, it, when we approach the scriptures, if we take the prophetic word of God out of context and try to make it fit our own interests, whether they be interests... Um, on a personal level or a corporate level. If we take the Word of God out of context and read it into our own interpretation to make it fit with our own interests, we will inevitably spawn our own doctrines that God never intended and we most certainly will go astray. Rather than fighting for God as we desire to establish His kingdom on earth on our own terms, we will find ourselves fighting against God and the truth of his word. This is a real danger and we need to beware. This is a danger that Peter warns the church of. The apostle Paul also warns of the same attitude and instructs the young pastor Timothy to ensure that he preaches the word of truth to the people as God intended it to be preached and understood. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verses 2 to 4, preach the word be prepared in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and encourage with every form of patient instruction. For a time will come when men will not tolerate sound doctrine, 
but with itching ears they will gather around themselves teachers to suit their own desires. So they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. You see, human wisdom is limited. We might think that a certain thing makes sense, but we have to take the Word of God and and take it in context at face value. Even Plato, one of the great secular philosophers of the Greek culture who actually died in 348 BC, that was well before Peter was born, he acknowledged as well that mere human reasoning about things that are and that might be to come was not sufficient to answer the riddles by which humanity is confronted. Now, Plato said this, he says, we must lay hold of the best human opinion in order that, born by it on a react, we may sail over the dangerous sea of life unless we can find a stronger boat or some sure word of God which will more surely and safely carry us. So what Peter is saying here and what he is presenting, he is showing the church through what he's speaking here an example of what the stronger boat is how does this apply to us today well we must be so careful when we listen to what is being said out there on the airwaves or from behind pulpits the ears of men including our own in our natural fleshly inclination will itch to hear things that appeal to and make sense to our human reasoning in the flesh But we've got to be careful that uh, we don't allow our flesh to be the dictator of what truth is. So we need to be prayerful, we need to be students of God's Word, and we need to keep things in the context for which they were designed. As such, if we're not careful, we can easily be fooled into being diverted onto a path of learning that has no impulse from God. I pray that this morning that you would be encouraged to follow the teachings of the Apostle, to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ in the Beatitudes, and to be watchful and to pray for that day when Jesus will come again and he will make all things right in this world and we'll be ushered into his presence where we'll be with him forever. God bless you this day. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Jesus, thank you for your children. Thank you for your church. God, I I pray that you would help the church to understand that you, you have everything under your controls and you have a plan in all things that are taking place even now. Nothing escapes your gaze and we can rest in you. Lord, help us to be followers of your word and context. Help us to review um, the scriptures and to seek them and to mine them for the truth. And Holy Spirit, enlighten us and bring to light the things that we need to know. Amen.